Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Bob Littman, President of the City Club's Board of Directors. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Chris Edmonds, pastor of the Piney Grove Baptist Church and founder of the Rhodey Edmonds Foundation. Pastor Edwards is a friend of our community and even had the opportunity yesterday to throw out the first pitch at our Indians game and a win, I may add. <laughs> Uh, today's forum is the Inspiration, the Robert D. Grease Endowed Forum, which celebrates individuals whose courageous actions encourage and inspire us to think differently, feel passionately, and act tenderly. The story you will hear from Pastor Edmonds today is no different. It's set against the backdrop of war. As Major Dick Winters, author of Beyond Band of Brothers, has said, quote, wars do not make men great, but they do bring out greatness in good men. And this is one such story, the story of one man, Pastor Edmonds' father, Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds, who, in the face of extreme injustice and hatred, took a risk and stood up for those facing persecution, and he did it in, an, in a hostile environment in a POW camp. He did it quietly, yet forcibly, without prompting, without consideration for himself, and without promise of accolades or acknowledgement. And in doing so, he saved many, many lives. Even though the story takes place more than 70 years ago, Master Sergeant Edmund's actions and their effects are timeless. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome Pastor Chris Edmonds. Thank you, Bob, uh, and thank you, City Club. It's a great honor to be with you today. Um, and before I begin, um, a lot of times people ask where I'm from, and I say Maryville, Tennessee, but really where I'm from, it's not Maryville, it's Murville. <laughs> so tell some, look at someone and say Murville. <laughs> now say, how you doing? <laughs> you are now officially East Tennessee Hillbillies. <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Grease. Thank you so much for uh, sponsoring this forum and, and endowing. Um, ins inspiration uh, is what we all need. So thank you for the privilege and the honor to be here. It's, it's, a, it's a joy. Um, and Dan, and City Club, wow, hats off to you and your rock star staff. <laughs> you are amazing. Now give them a big hand. They are upstanders for sure to put up with me. Uh, but your legacy of, of what you do here, giving voice to esteemed world changers for centuries now, I mean for, for years, is, is remarkable and enduring. So thank you. Thank you for giving free speech. Uh, center stage and giving a voice to the spirit of freedom because that's what we all need. And on a personal note, I'm grateful for the opportunity to throw the first pitch yesterday uh, at the Indians game, which uh, I'm a big baseball fan, so being at any baseball stadium is, is amazing. What a moment, and no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were three of us who threw pitches, a 10-year-old boy who barely missed outside, and then a, an older teenage girl who got lots of grace when she bounced it twice beside the plate. And then me, the old guy. And I know what everybody's thinking, you know, when, he, when he's out there. Um, they're thinking, can he even get it to the plate? And uh, I said, uh, maybe I'll roll it in. But thankfully, God was with me, and uh, it sailed in for a strike. And 
at a blistering 30 miles per hour. <laughs> the, the Indian's mascot, Slider, he, he, he was so impressed. He goes, loved it. <laughs> and uh, I told him, well, wait till you see my change up. <laughs> so Dan, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. They do a terrific job. To my friends at the Jewish Federation, uh, and also Facing History and Ourselves, and also Cole Israel Foundation, thank you so much for what you do. It's outstanding, the work you do in this community, for your caring, your loving, your leading, your giving, and most of all, your transforming. Thank you so much for what you do. I had the privilege of speaking at Facing History High School this morning uh, with the seniors. And uh, I, I told everyone, I had a good time. I don't know if they did, but I had a good time. And it was, it was a great, uh, great meeting. Cleveland is richer because of these groups. I hope you know that. And our world is much better because of the work that they do. They are upstanders and heroic. Let's give all of them a big hand as well. <laughs> Inscribed on my wristband that I wear everywhere, is the, are the words, what you do matters. I got this at the Holocaust Museum in DC. Why do they matter? What we do, why does it matter? Well, you and I make choices, and those choices make history. And today I'm gonna to share with you a story about a person who had to make choices. And the choices he made 71 years ago, are historic, made a big difference in the lives of people. Some of the people that are in this room today, and it's, it's an incredible story, one that I'm honored really to share. Now let me go ahead and warn you, I am a pastor, so I've come to do a few things. One, I will brag on God, okay? Uh, number two, I will honor the men and my dad who served so well during World War II, and really all our veterans, all of our current uh, armed forces. Do we have any veterans in the room, armed, armed force folks? Hold your hands up. Please give them a hand as well. Thank you for your service. You guys are awesome. The final thing I want, want us to do, and really want, to, every time I tell this story, I'm inspired more. And so I want us all to take a nugget of inspiration with us as we leave. So repeat after me. I will, I will. Make, a difference. make a difference. Because I'm convinced that your ordinary life, and I see a lot of ordinary people here today, right? We're all ordinary people. But your ordinary life, lived well, is extraordinary. And to lots of people, it's heroic. So I'm going to challenge you as I challenge myself. Live well. Live heroic. Be the hero where you are, no matter the circumstances. Do the right thing. It will make a huge difference. It will make you an upstander. Today, the upstander we're going to meet, he, he lived by a clear moral and spiritual code. It was, it was part of his DNA. So I hope you will listen well and you will look and learn from his code. Now, everybody, hold, hold your hand out like this. It's, I want to make sure we're listening. I want to make sure we're focused, okay? Hold your hand out like this, big zero, kind of, or O, like this, okay? I want, on the count of three, I want you to follow my instructions. Make sure we're focused on the count of three. One, two, three. Put your hand on your chin. 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 Okay, now put your hand on your chin. Most of you were going. <laughs> and now that we're listening, my story begins with an old diary, a weathered and fragile book. The diary belonged to a young man from Tennessee, fighting for his life on a continent near the edge of collapse. Its owner, my father, passed away years earlier. Since then, the diary remained just sort of tucked away safely tucked away with other mementos from dad's time in the war. He had served with distinction. Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds of the 106th Infantry was captured in the Battle of the Bulge, and he spent 100 harsh, 
harsh days in two German POW camps toward the end of the war. Now, this was the story our family knew. Uh, to us, it was the totality of his service, but it was service he never, ever talked about. Even when I would, would ask him questions, he wouldn't say much. Son, don't want to talk about it. Or son, we were humiliated. While reading Dad's diary one evening, late one evening, many years after his passing, his words stirred my heart. In it, he wrote this. A lot of things I'm not going to write because they're not exactly nice to talk about. No one can realize the horrors an infantry soldier goes through. You get scared. And I mean scared. I know God was with us, and he answered our prayers. Now listen to this. I learned men even better than before. Some were good. Some were bad. Some were better. Some were worse. Dad's diary really inspired me to take a look further into his service and, and to uncover the true story of his time as a prisoner of war. And this is one of those God moments. I would not have discovered this, I'm going to brag on God, had he not revealed this to me in his time and in his way. Late one evening, just past midnight, I searched God's name, I mean not God's name, Dad's name and his rank on the computer. Remarkably, Dad's name appeared in an article entitled Richard Nixon Search for a New York Home. Now the article recounts how an attorney named Lester Tanner sold his historic townhouse to the president in the 1970s. In the middle of the article, Mr. Tanner speaks of the bravery and courage of his master sergeant and names him Roddy Edmonds. Well, I'm stunned. What is Dad's name doing in an article about the president in 2008? Who is Lester Tanner? What, what does he mean by bravery and courage? All these questions are flooding me. Is Mr. Tanner still alive? And if so, where is he? Well, I find him in New York. Now, imagine, after months of searching, I find Lester and he invites me to come to New York to meet with him. Go away! <laughs> I'm going to New York City! <laughs> Woo! Where's my shoes, honey? I got to put my shoes on. <laughs> you talk about hicks in the big town. But it was an amazing adventure. We love New York City. And oh, by the way, we love Cleveland as well. <laughs> Cleveland is awesome. As a matter of fact, my grandson told me yesterday, he goes, Pop, I think I like Cleveland better than New York. <laughs> I said, why? He says, well, it's laid back, everybody's friendly, it's not so crazy, it's just cool. Yeah. Would you agree? Yeah. So we go to New York City and we meet Mr. Tanner. And, and like Dad, Mr. Tanner was a person, an American, who served with honor during World War II. The day I met Lester, I learned the true story of my dad's time as a prisoner of war. Dad was the highest ranking American soldier in Stalag 9A, a POW camp for non-commissioned officers near Zagenhain, Germany. It was near the end of the war, January 1945. Even in the POW camps, the Nazis had strict anti-Jew policies and they segregated Jewish POWs from non-Jews, sending them to harsh labor camps where they met usually with certain death. American Jewish soldiers were told if they, uh, they were told to destroy their dog tags if they ever fell into enemy hands. So late on the evening, January 26, the Nazis sent orders to the American barracks and to my father. The orders were this, they wanted only the Jewish soldiers to fall out at the next morning's roll call. Without hesitation, my dad turned to his men and said, we're not doing that. Tomorrow morning, we all fall out. And he sent orders to the other barracks. And that's what they did. It was bitterly cold that morning, January 27, 1945. 
As the ruthless commander approached, he couldn't believe his eyes. There before him were all of the American soldiers standing in sharp formation, more than 1,200 American non-commissioned officers reporting for duty. Enraged, the Nazi, I mean, he couldn't believe it. He stormed over to my father and he said, they cannot all be Jews. To which my father replied, we are all Jews here. Well, that enraged him. He, he, he turned blood red. He couldn't believe that this little sergeant... Now, I, I'm, I'm a chip off the old block. <laughs> this little pipsqueak sergeant was standing up to him and defying him. He was enraged. So he turned blood red and he pulled out his gun and he pressed it into my father's head and he said, one last chance, Sergeant. You will order the Jewish prisoners to step forward or I will shoot you right now. Well, by this point, Dad and his men had seen untold horrors. Brutal battle, the Battle of the Bulge, the largest and bloodiest battle of World War II, where more than 89,000 men were, were wounded, killed, or captured. They had experienced the death march of seven days of no food and no water, murderous trail of death. And as they walked through knee-deep snow and trudged up hills and through valleys and they slept on the side of the road or they slept in barns or wherever the Germans would let them sleep, many men did not make it. Skip, who you'll, you'll meet a little bit later from right here in Cleveland, told me this, if you couldn't march, you didn't last. They'd been bombed while imprisoned in a boxcar on Christmas Eve of 1944, left for dead by the Germans. There were thousands of POWs, American POWs, and as the British came over to bomb Hamburg's trail, uh, trail yard, uh, train yard, they dropped bombs on the Americans and did not know it. Many men died, including my dad's chaplain. At this moment in time, with the gun pressed to his head, there's 40 days of starvation that is behind them. On average, the men had, were losing a pound a day. I think Skip lost 60 to 80 pounds while he was there. They'd been beaten, they'd been kicked, they'd been humiliated, they'd been rifle punched, they'd been beaten by dogs. They, they, they were infested with lice. They had all sorts of problems of pain and agony with their physical self. And like Dad said, they'd been stripped of their dignity and humiliated. And just two days earlier, when they marched them into this new camp, they had to witness a savage execution of a young Russian soldier before their very eyes. And they were threatened the same would happen to them if they disobeyed orders. Yet there Dad stood. He stood. And the men stood, strong, fearless, resolute, staring at death, standing for life, standing on his convictions, standing against oppression, standing for the dignity that the Nazis were trying to rob them of, standing with everyone together. Well, finally, Dad spoke. Witnesses tell me he spoke calmly, he spoke confidently. With the gun to his head, he said, Major, if you shoot me, you'll have to kill us all because we know who you are and you'll stand for war crimes when we win this war and you will pay. Lester tells me he was just a few feet away. He said, the Nazi Major blanched and began trembling. He said, but your father stood strong as a rock. And suddenly, without warning, the Nazi pulled his gun to his side, placed it in his holster, turned, and walked back toward his office, never to try to separate the Jewish men again. 
That's an amazing act of courage. Not only by my father, but by those men. According to Lester and other witnesses, Dad's actions saved the lives of nearly 200 Jewish soldiers that day. Lester told me, from that moment on, he based the rest of his life on the values and the choices that my father made that day. Lester told himself he would always do the right thing, regardless of the risk and regardless of the consequences. And he tells me, and for a New York lawyer, that's kind of tough. <laughs> Now in his 90s, Lester still keeps that promise. That is a promise you and I should aspire to keep. This past December, I made my first visit to Israel. It's a dream come true for any pastor and really for anybody. If you haven't been to Israel, they haven't put me on, on the uh, tour, tourism staff yet, but go. <laughs> it's a great place. While there, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Remembrance Authority, and the nation of Israel announced Dad would be honored as one of the righteous among the nations. Righteous among the nations is the highest honor given to non-Jews who risked their lives to protect Jews during the Holocaust. They are upstanders. Dad's, if you hold your hand out like this, give me a five. Give me a five. Dad's only the fifth American to receive this honor. Now give me a one. He is the first U.S. soldier to receive this award. Give me one more one. I know I'm working you to death. <laughs> he is the only, the first and only of the righteous to save American Jews. Amazing. Well, the righteous ceremony was pretty amazing too. It was hosted by Ambassador Dermer, Israel's ambassador to the United States, with Prime Minister Netanyahu speaking live from Israel. How cool is that? It was attended by Chief Rabbi Lau of Israel, amazing gentleman. My senators, Lamar Alexander, Bob Corker came. That was incredible. I actually got to talk to my senators. <laughs> and a host of dignitaries, including President Obama. That was a, an amazing moment to be able to have the president to come to the embassy of Israel. First time ever a sitting president has come to the embassy. First time ever they had a ceremony to honor the righteous there. It was unprecedented. And our family are, is forever grateful to Mr. Obama for coming. And he brought along a friend, Steven Spielberg. So I can take off my bucket list, <laughs> warming up the crowd for Mr. Spielberg and the president. <laughs> it still seems so surreal, but right sitting just as close as the grease are was President Obama, Steven Spielberg and I was having to speak. <laughs> At the ceremony, uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. It happened exactly 71 years to the day. It was January 27, 2016. Exactly 71 years to the day that Dad stood up for his men. Um, and it was a ceremony that was incredible. And Dad, Dad stood up for his men because it was the core of his being. Lester told the world, a watching world, at that ceremony, Roddy could no more give up his men than to stop breathing. That's conviction. Well, it's, it's been a great honor. Um, we're pursuing a Medal of Honor, so if you know of a congressman or a senator, <laughs> Help us out. My family and I are very proud of Dad, and we're very proud of the choices he made. We're blessed, so blessed to have learned his story. But even more blessed, and this is the good part, and, and I'm going to close out after this, but I wanted to get to this part. We're even more blessed to have met some of the men and their families 
who he helped save. Lester Tanner of New York, I've mentioned, Paul Stern of Virginia, Sonny Fox of California, Henry Hank Friedman of Georgia, and Cleveland's own son and World War II hero, Sidney Skip Friedman of Shaker Heights, Ohio. Give Skip a hand. Isn't he a good-looking guy? Well, he couldn't be with us today, but his family, many of his families here, and so a few dear, and they're my family now, but they've adopted me, a Southern Baptist pastor. <laughs> Explain that to your rabbi. <laughs> Would Skip's family please stand? We want to say thank you. David. Rachel and Amy and Peter uh, and, and all of your family. I love you guys. And, and I love Skip. And Skip is, is an upstander and he's one of my heroes along with my dad. So thank you for just being who you are and for the love you've shown me. Thank you for bringing all these students. You brought a bunch of students with you today, didn't you, Peter? Way to go. Skip, um, along with Dad, this is where I'll, I'll, I'll kind of close my remarks. Skip, along with Dad, uh, are heroes. Skip served our country well during World War II, and he overcame the same hellish POW camps as Dad. Now listen to this. His victory over the horrors of war did not defeat him but rather inspired him to return to America and do well, live well. Uh, he finished his college. He married his sweetheart, the lovely Pearl Klausner, Penny, as everybody knew her. He raised a family. He was a terrific citizen. He was an outstanding attorney. I think he's still doing legal work. It, if you talk to him, he's definitely breaking it down for you. He led a life of influence and significance right here in Cleveland, his beloved hometown. And so I salute him. He is a great joy. If he were here, you would love to spend time with him. So my dad's legacy are these men like Skip and their children and their grandchildren and even now their great-grandchildren. Thousands of people are alive today because of the choices he made. He was an ordinary guy just like you, just like me. But in a seminal moment, he made the right decision. And he had really made that decision years before when he decided that he was going to follow God and love people like God loves people. Because that's the one thing that he did well, is he loved God, he loved his country, and he loved people. You know, I said that uh, he stood on his convictions. He did. He stood against oppression because he believed every man and woman, boy and girl, are equal in God's sight and in His. He also stood for dignity. He and Skip and all these other men that I've met, life is precious and life is a gift. They treasured it. And they stood with everyone. They stood together. You know, equality is powerfully needed in our country today, in our world, in our communities, probably maybe even in your home. We need, to, we need to understand that all of us are equal. We're all in the same boat, this boat of life, and we need each other just like those men did in that camp. So I want to raise the level of our consciousness as I close from being equal, which we all are already. God told us that, so it's, it's a done deal. Okay. Let's raise it to where we esteem one another better than ourselves. This world will be the place we want it to be if I will look to you and say, he's, he's first or she's first, I'm last. And if I will esteem you and honor you and show you the dignity and the worth that you really contain and have, 
then equality becomes a, an irrelevant issue. Does it not? So from this day forward, I challenge you to be an upstander and look at everyone that you meet, whether you agree with them, whether you like them, you look at them and you enjoy them and you praise them and you lift them up and you bless them because they are worthy and they deserve it and you share your love with them just like these men did. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for listening so well. And we're going to do a time of question here in a few minutes. But thank you so much. Pastor Edmonds, uh, your dad's story certainly defines the meaning of, of the word inspirational. Thank you thank so you. much for, for sharing his story. Appreciate it. Today at the City Club, we are enjoying a Friday Forum with Chris Edmonds, pastor of Piney Grove Baptist Church and founder of the Rhodey Edmonds Foundation. Pastor Edmonds is here today as part of Inspiration, the Robert D. Grease Endowed Forum made possible by a generous gift from Sally Grease and the Grease Generation 6 Fund. Thank you. We thank you for your continued uh, support of the City Club. Today's forum... I apologize. <laughs> We're going to start over. T today we are enjoying a Friday forum with Chris Edmonds, pastor of Piney Grove Baptist Church and founder of the Rhodey Edmonds Foundation. We are about to begin the Q&A. Thank you. We welcome questions from everybody, City Club members, guests, mm -hmm. students, or those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, webcast, or our new live simulcast at the Parma Snow branch of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will try to work it into the program. We want to remind you that your questions should be brief and to the point and actually be questions. Holding the microphones today are Content Coordinator Teddy Eisenberg, Director of Programming, and Director of Programming Stephanie Jansky. May we have the first question, please? Can, can I use this and walk around? Okay, good. You joked some about your home state, mm -hmm. and yet I detect great affection in your joking. And I would welcome hearing something of where the character that your father showed came from. In particular, if you could tell us something about his parents, your paternal grandparents, I would be grateful. Thank you. Great question, by the way. I do love Tennessee. Uh, I love East Tennessee, and we do wear shoes. I was just <laughs> kidding about that. Although my wife grew up without shoes, so she's got pretty tough feet, and, and now I'm in trouble. But anyway, I stay that way. My father was born in 1919, and uh, he experienced the, all the uh, disappointments and the frustrations of the Depression. Uh, as a 10-year-old as a kid and, and a teenager. When he was age three, his mom passed away. And he, um, he and his father and other brothers, he had older, two, three older brothers, uh, all, all boys, so there were four boys in the family. They moved in with uh, my grandfather's sister, who I never met, I never knew her. And uh, he got his character really from his family. My, my grandfather, uh, was a man of great strength and character. He was a, a, a paper hanger, is what back in the day, is what they, they called it. He, he hung wallpaper. And uh, he was also, uh, my grandfather was also a, very, a man of faith, uh, of the Methodist background. And he uh, was what was called an old harp singer. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, heard of that. They sang by shape notes. Uh, that was back in the day before gospel quartets. Um, and so, Dad grew up in a home that was structured and, and the core beliefs was that God is real and God is good and God loves everyone. And so he, he experienced that kind of home growing up. But it wasn't an easy life. Uh, our, he, he grew up in South Knoxville, so we're really Southern. Um, and. 
Every day he would go to school, particularly in high school. The high school uh, was several miles away, and he would walk along with others from his neighborhood to school. And I, Regina's, my, my wife's great aunt, we, we, uh, when I married into the family, I uh, met her, and when the story came out, she goes, I grew up with your father. Who knew? She graduated with my dad, lived across the street from him. So she shared a lot of stories. She said, your father was kind of the, the, the neighborhood guy who got all the kids together and played games with them and uh, said the kids loved him. Said he would walk every day to school and his lunch was a hard biscuit. So uh, he, he didn't have the best of things growing up, but he had the right things growing up. And that's love of family, love of community. And uh, he certainly felt loved by God. So that's where he, he forged his, his character. Um, I also thought he was kind of quite natural at that. If, if he were here today, He'd light this room up. You'd know he was here. You'd love being around him. When he, when he leaves the party, everybody wants to go with him. That's the kind of guy he is. And um, just, just a great individual. But he did have a firm faith in God. He, he was a Christian man. And, and one of the reasons I'm, I pursued the ministry was because I saw in him um, things that uh, were important, that became important to me. I really, I really was drawn to his faith, and then I made it my faith, not because of him particularly, but indirectly it was really about, about his walk. He was a great dad too. He was an older dad. Uh, I was, when I was born, I was 40, uh, he was 40 years old. I wasn't 40. He was 40 years old. <laughs> How would you like that to be born at 40? That would be <laughs> bad. Uh, he had already experienced two marriages, failed marriages, before he met my mom. One of the things in the diary that you will note is that if, if you ever read his diary, and hopefully we will publish that someday near, near term, but he, um, his first wife he met just prior going into the, to the service. He went in March of 1941 before Pearl Harbor. He, he became a master, went in as a private in March of 41, and became a master sergeant in 42. At the time, he was the youngest master sergeant ever appointed. And um, he, um, he was married. And while he was, you know, on, uh, he came back home for a little while, left, left his station and post and got to be off and came back home and she became pregnant. And while he was shipped overseas and was actually had just, just prior to his capture, he'd received a Dear John letter from her. And she said, I'm divorcing you. And so that's in the diary. He's, he's being encouraged by his, his buddies. And all he wants to do is go back home, fix his family. Well, little known to me is I've got a sister who I just met two weeks before the ceremony who's lived in South Knoxville all these years. And she's a wonderful, wonderful lady. And we're, we're now are growing that relationship. But, uh, so two failed marriages and then he met my mom. I'm so glad he didn't give up. <laughs> <laughs> and the other failed marriage happened while he was in Korea. He went back, they called him up and we went back to Korea. After serving as a POW, he went, if, if I could talk to him for just a second, why did you do that? <laughs> but, another question. Yes, um, I'm with the Coal Israel Organization. Thank you and for having I've, me today. Oh, certainly. Um, and I, our families have all suffered a great deal because people haven't stood up as your father did. And I just wondered if your father even knew any Jews before that, if he just loved people so much he did it, or if he had known people who had encouraged him to see Jews as people like himself. <laughs> That I don't know without him being here. I do know that uh, in Knoxville, back in the 30s and 40s, there weren't a lot of Jewish people there. Uh, but there was, I have looked through the newspapers and, and, and I've talked to some folks who were living back during that day, even Regina's aunt. Uh, there was some level of anti-Semitism even in Knoxville at the time. And uh, 
But my dad, uh, I do know he had Jewish friends when I, when I actually appeared on the scene and started growing up, uh, he had some Jewish friends. But the testimonies from, from the, some of the men that I've met have said that he didn't attach any kind of problem to anything about anybody. He said he was a leader among men is what they said. Uh, one of the greatest things that I appreciate about what, what they shared with me, Lester particularly, he said, your father was tough as nails as a sergeant. He expected a lot out of us. And when we were in maneuvers or in battle, he was in charge. And we were glad he was in charge. And that's when he, he said he was a leader among men. He said, but when we were not on the clock, so to speak, he was one of us. And he said, the reason we followed him, said we would have followed him anywhere. The reason we would follow him because he loved us and cared about us. And it wasn't about we were his soldiers. We were his friends. And, uh, you know, the mark of a great leader, any leader, whether you're in the, in the military or whether you're in a corporation or whether you're in, the, in your family, the mark of a great leader is you care about your troops. And he did. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Uh, you, uh, when you were talking to the family, you said uh, something about mentioning to your rabbi that, I don't know what, you, you met the Baptist pastor, um, mine who is sitting right here. Got and to I've, meet you I've, too. And I've met, yes, I've, I've and met. And you have met him, and everyone is invited to Fairmont Temple at 615 tonight for services <laughs> where Chris will join us. Secondly, thanks for showing my mother's picture there, but I'm not Skip's son. But my mother is her identical twin, was her identical twin. Now, I can't talk about the, uh, the values you talked about with the eloquence with which you do so. But you mentioned in passing almost that you're, you're trying to get a Medal of Honor for your father. Yes. And many people in this room, including me, know a senator who we can speak to. So <laughs> Thank the question, you. So the question is, my, my question is, what is the issue? with that, why hasn't it happened, what needs to happen, et cetera. Okay. Have you got a week? <laughs> no. Um, well, all of this began after I met Lester in New York in about 2011. And I came back home with, inspired to go to my congressman and pursue the Medal of Honor. Did that, he was wonderfully helpful, involved. I actually have a a leadership team. I have a staff person from our two senators and from our my local congressman, and we meet together on a pretty regular basis. Uh, so we began that, and it took about a year and a half to get all of the testimonies and the, the reference material and all the information that's required. It's a big, big deal. Okay. We submitted it to the Army, and uh, after a couple of months, the Army sent a letter back and said, Based upon Master Sergeant Edmonds being a POW, he would not be eligible for a Medal of Honor because he was not in combat. Okay. I don't know how you describe combat. You have a gun pointed to your head. You have no weapons except your willpower. Um, so the Army has had precedence in the past there's been years in the past where they have awarded a Medal of Honor for POWs taking action while a POW. But in recent years, they've decided that's not worthy. And so they've, and they're the only uh, part of the branch, uh, armed services uh, branches that do that that way. So there's no consistency. So we've been fighting with this. I'm gonna get on this side over here because you guys feel lonely and left out, right? <laughs> okay. So we, we, we we sent another package back to them with some additional information and with justification. Here's why we think he's, and again, the Army said no. Now, they, they do want to award him a high medal, but not a valor medal. They say he was not deserving of a valor medal. Well, every general I've talked to in the Army, every person of rank I've talked to in the Army are dumbfounded, and they cannot believe that. Even the president himself said, what your dad did was above and beyond the call of duty. The president's on our side. He's just waiting for the Army to get their act together. <laughs> so y'all pray for me. I'm trying to get a meeting with the president, so I can go up there and say, why don't you help them get their act together? <laughs> um, but so all this started 
with the Medal of Honor process, and we're still doing that. It's, right now it's in Congress. My congressman put a bill in. It's with the Armed Services Committee, and we need all the support we can get. Uh, you can go online and Google it, Roddy Edmonds Medal of Honor bill. I think it's 4867. Um, every congressman I've talked to and met, every leader in the country I've met are for it. It's just that it's way down here in the pile of stuff, and you know how that can happen. So we need to get it up. But the righteous among the nations came from the exact material that we gave to the Army. And they actually took it and vetted it for a year. They, they interviewed, they called, they, they did their due diligence, and then they said, my dad deserves. And I didn't even know that was going on. That was done behind my back, believe it or not, <laughs> by a friend of Lester. Um, a Jewish man who travels to Israel a lot and uh, he felt like dad deserved at least to be recommended for that and he did and the rest is history. It's pretty amazing. So help. Thank you. By any chance, do you remember the date when the ceremony was for your dad for being a righteous Gentile? Yeah, it was January, this past January. Oh, 27th, because I just saw a movie uh, that is going to be on television on 25, on the 20th, and they had five Americans who got the honor, but your dad was not included. So maybe it was filmed yeah, it, before. It, 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 it was probably filmed before. Yeah. Because I was look, I knew I'm coming here, and I was looking for his name, but it wasn't there. It was yeah, it was probably before. We got the actual notice from uh, Israel uh, June of 2015, and then uh, the award was made this, this past year, this year. Yes? It has become evident that the University of Tennessee in Knoxville has a great degree of anti-Semitism. I wonder what's being done about that. Well, it... It's, that's happening on a lot of campuses across the country, I know that, and, yes. and that is something that all of us need to stand against. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I know uh, there's not a lot of effort from anybody I can see. Other the the, the Jewish community there is there, and uh, there's some Christian churches involved and pastors involved in trying to refute that. Um, but and, and I'm I'm involved as an APAC member as well in fighting that and resisting that. But uh, it is uh, it's a growing growing issue, and I really do believe that this story has been revealed to me and my family and even to the world for a time such as this because um, Dad's story refutes all of that and stands against all of that, and I do too. I stand with my Jewish brothers and sisters, and I stand with Israel, and uh, I stand with everybody because we're, we're, we're all in this together, and we can learn in, from each other, we can love each other, and we can uh, not just go along to get along, but we really treasure each other as well. Uh, some of my newest and best friends are Jewish men and women and boys and girls. They're amazing. I, I've been to bar mitzvahs. <laughs> I spoke at a bar mitzvah. Who knew? Yeah. A little boy, uh, he's, he was 13 at the time. Uh, I spoke at the APAC conference in Washington. 18,000 people were in the room. I, yeah, any of you there for that? That was, I, I didn't see you, but I, <laughs> I spoke just before Vice President Biden and all of the political, you know, candidates for, for president were there as well and just the it was amazing, but it was, what an incredible opportunity. And this little 13-year-old boy, he, he was there with his dad. He goes, I want him at my bar mitzvah. <laughs> so his dad calls me. He tracks me down. We go, me and my grandson, who's 13, Austin, we go to Connecticut, and we attend the bar. I said, what do you want me here for? I'm a preacher. You know, you're like, we want you to speak to the kids. So uh, I've been executive director of an organization for a number of years, and, and we work with middle school students. So I'm around middle school students all the time. And anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was really a lot of fun. <laughs> and it was meaningful, powerfully meaningful. And so we attended Friday night. Uh, the, the, 
really, I guess that, what, what's that called? The, a lot of food, I know that. <laughs> I'm good with that. Baptists are good with food. And then um, the next day at the Bar Mitzvah, I was, I was the last speaker. What a privilege and honor. Uh, and he's a great young man. He's an upstander. That little fellow's an upstander, and so is his family. Anybody else? Yep. My name is Avi Goldman. I'm, um, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a child of survivors, and I uh, want to thank you very much for bringing your story to Cleveland, and I hope that the story goes beyond Cleveland also to many other cities. Thank you. Before I ask my question, I'm, I'm honored to be sitting next to two Holocaust survivors here. That, um, that, that take a lot of their time talking to children, schools all over Northeast Ohio about Wonderful. their experiences during the Holocaust. And believe me, when they are done with their stories, their, the life of those kids change also. Mm -hmm. And you are changing lives also. And ho keep doing it for many years. Basically, my question is, before you found the diary, how close were you to stories or the Holocaust? Did you know anything about the Holocaust? Or did the diary change your views about the Jewish tradition, Jewish people? Was that a change in your life? Can you tell us a little before and after the diary yep. how your life changed? Uh, to answer that just bluntly, no, it did not change my view of Jewish people or Jewish culture. I've, I've always, as a, as a man of faith, as a pastor, Israel and Jewish people are central to my faith, okay? Have always been that way. So um, you, you are a blessing to me, and I want to bless you back as well. So, but it added so much more, uh, I, I don't know how to, it, it just created more of what I had already experienced, uh, the, the love and the passion I have for Jewish people. Um, so before actually digging into the diary, you know, I had some Jewish friends and I knew, I thought I knew a lot about the Holocaust because I'd studied on it, I had delved you know, dug into it and that kind of thing. And then I went to Yad Vashem uh, for a leadership conference. I didn't know a whole lot about the Holocaust because they taught me tons over there. Um, but we need more of that in this country and across the world. Uh, people are, are uh, not, uh, they're not getting enough information and truth about the Holocaust. And I, I was asking kids today at a high school, uh, how many of you heard of the Battle of the Bulge? No hand went up. I said, World War II? <laughs> Hands went up. So it's all surface. We've got to get them down into why World War II happened and specifics of that and what happened during that time. But God bless both of you. Thank you so much for what you do. It's amazing. I've met several Holocaust survivors and Every one of your stories are remarkable, and they're stories we need to treasure. So thank you. Another one to thank you so much for taking personal time to make your way up here, and your family that joined you, You're very much appreciated. It's a real mitzvah to us, as we say here. Um, what a great story about your father. Um, is there anything thank else you. you can share with us, positive? about his, uh, his life after the service? Yes. Um, after he got out of uh, the service from Korea, uh, he came back home, he met my mom. He was a singer, uh, a, a gospel singer. Uh, loved to sing. If he were here, he'd, he'd belt you one out. Um, um, he, he loved his community. He was a, in sales. So he was really good with people, so obviously he gravitated towards sales. He didn't go to college, which that's one thing I would... I, when I get to talk to him again, and I do believe I will someday, and I was just going to say, why didn't, why didn't you do the GI Bill? Why didn't you go to college? He just did not do that. I don't know why. But he still was a man who provided for our family. And uh, he was good at selling stuff. Um, he was also very faithful in the community. He, he attended all of my school events, 
even as an older daddy, was our, my baseball coach out there on the field and helping all the little leaguers. You, you know what a disaster that is when you got little kids out on the baseball field. And he was so loving and patient and wonderful with that. Um, and, and over the years, uh, he, he was involved with the POW groups uh, along the way, particularly in our hometown. He's very active uh, with the, PL, the AMVETs and the POWs. Um, and he was a servant. He served in the church. He, he was music director in several churches. So uh, he, he was a great father figure, and, and he invested time in us as a family as well. He loved us well. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. Thank you. Today at the Thank City you. Club, we Thank are enjoying you. a Friday Forum with Chris Edmonds, pastor of Piney Grove Baptist Church and founder of the Roddy Edmonds Foundation. Today's forum is sponsored by the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, and our community partners are facing history and ourselves and the Cole Israel Foundation. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We thank all of you for your support and partnership. Additionally, we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Facing History New Tech Board of Directors, Fairmont Temple, Friends of David Klausner, and the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage. We thank you for being here today as well. Lastly, we welcome students from Chardon High School, Facing History New Tech High School, and Montessori High School at University Suicle. Student participation in the City Club Forums is provided by a grant from the Lobb Foundation. We appreciate your support of our student programming. And that brings us to the end of our forum today. Thank you, Pastor Edwards. Thank you, ladies and, and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club Forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Cleveland State University, Robert Conrad, and the Payne Fund.